I was really trying to pass it, but my hand wasn't used to doing it. And so the ball was like going toward the rim. It was like, I'm not supposed to go over there. Welcome to What's On My Mind podcast with Eddie Johnson. Welcome. Happy holidays to you and yours. And here's to wishing 2016 will be your best year to date. This is What's On My Mind podcast with Eddie Johnson, number three. This podcast is brought to you by Jason Mitchell Realty Group. If you are in the market to buy or sell your home, I recommend Jason and his team at Realty Executives. From just about every accolade you can receive, on a local and national level, their technology and resources are simply the best in the business. So please give Jason and his team a call at 480-522-1030. Again, that's 480-522-1030. Or visit them at mitchellgroupaz.com. Now, what is your best Christmas gift? Man, mine was a red truck at nine years old. What about you? I mean, my mom got that and she couldn't afford it. I mean, she's on one salary taking care of seven kids. But I remember that truck like no other. And my best New Year's resolution happened at the beginning of my sophomore season. Here I am trying to be a great student and trying to get better at basketball, but not where I needed to be. And standing at a bus stop going to practice at 5.30 a.m. in the morning, the wind chill was about 30 below. I'm standing next to this elderly lady. I'm tearing up and I'm just frustrated. And I stood there and I said, you know what, Eddie, make a resolution that you're going to be the best student and the best basketball player you could be. And I'm telling you, if you saw me as a basketball player at that point, I sucked. But something about me making that resolution it pushed me, it focused me, and I went from the Frostoff team to varsity in a span of about three months. It was amazing, and I took off from there. All of a sudden, started getting scholarship offers from everyone in the country, and now we know the rest of the story. That was my New Year's resolution that has always stuck with me. What is yours? I'd love for you to tweet me on it. Really, treat me your Christmas gift and your New Year's resolution to Jump Shot 8. I would love to converse with you and we can share stories. Also, to download my podcast, you know, go to eddiejohnson8.com, all right? And you can listen to the audio version on iTunes. Subscribe, leave your comments, leave your reviews. It's extremely helpful for me as my podcast moves along. I appreciate you every week, and thank you again for taking the time to download podcast number three. I love my segments, and I hope you do too. And the great thing about these segments is it reattaches you to things that have happened in the past few weeks in my Big Dummy segment, and then it reattaches you to the past when I converse with players that had an impact on sports and probably you grew up paying attention to. And so as we move along to that segment that gets everyone's attention, and it's my big dummy segment, and I take a drink to it because you have to appreciate all the big dummies out there. That keeps me busy. And this segment is brought to you by the effort that I put in in purchasing this book, You Big Dummy, An Athlete's Simple Guide to a Successful Career. And this book is a blueprint for a lot of athletes out there, but also people that just want to make their lives better. And so every week when I try to identify a segment, I try to teach a lesson about the segment. And this segment is about my hometown, Chicago Bulls. I grew up a Bulls fan. I didn't enjoy Jordan winning the six because I was playing at that time. But my favorite all-time team 
included players like Bob Love, Chet Walker, Norm Van Leer, Jerry Sloan, Tom Borwinkle, and Bobby Weiss. I love that team. That's the team that made me fall in love with basketball. But this current Bulls team, they have a lot of issues. They're in a flux because their leadership is at an all-time low. Joaquin Noah, Derrick Rose, and Jimmy Butler have all said some dumb things this season. And they have a bright young coach in Fred Hoiberg. And I'm really feeling sorry for Fred. And we're going to discuss this and a few other things about the Chicago Bulls coming up in that segment you all love to see. It's time for the segment that makes us shake our heads. You big dummy. Welcome to my big dummy segment. And I have two special guests this week. And they're probably both going to raise my blood pressure sky high. Now, one guy already raises my blood pressure five days a week. And you all know him as, I call him the Terminator. His name is Justin Termini. Obviously, my boss at Sirius XM on our radio show, NBA Today, that you can listen to every day from 4 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Sirius XM NBA Radio. Justin, welcome. Thank you. And Edward, normally I try and raise your blood pressure. Today I'm just going to go straight to trying to end your life. So we'll try and get you worked up. Oh, I'm that's fine. And my other guest is my brother-in-law, Herbert Bias. And he's in Chicago, Illinois. And so don't be surprised who we're going to talk about today. And that is the Chicago Bulls. But Herbert has been my brother-in-law for 34 years. Joy and I have been married for 30, but I've known him four extra years on top of that. 34 years me and Herbert have been together. And he is the lawyer in the family. He has an opinion about everything, especially when it comes to sports. And I'm not going to even bring up my bears. Oh, but, please do not. All right. But Herbert, welcome. Thank you very much. We're glad to be here this morning. All right. Now, first I want to warn you that that guy that's on the screen said that he's dating your... Uh, My niece. Your niece, yeah. His niece, yeah. That's because I haven't met his family yet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, at the, maybe at the wedding, Herbert, you'll get a little... <laughs> uh, uh, because Jade and myself, your niece, have something planned here, I would say in the near future. <laughs> Hey, guys, we're going to talk about the Chicago Bulls. And Justin and I, we talk about them probably more than anything on the radio show. And this week, you know, we had a new adventure uh, with Jimmy Butler coming out and having his comments on what Fred Hoiberg should do. But I just want to just cycle back to you, Herbert. And you're in okay. Chicago. You follow the Bulls. I mean, you lived through the Michael Jordan era. What's yes. the word on the street? When it comes to your Chicago Bulls. Oh, boy. The word on the street is, well, here's my take. I've been saying for a while, Eddie, as you know this, I've been critiquing the star of the of the team very harshly. Before Jimmy Butler, it was Derrick Rose. You know, I don't call him Rose. I call him Dandelion because roses smell so much sweeter than the way he's been playing. Now, the word is, is that this group is constituted right now can't win anything. They need to blow it up and start over. Wow. I mean, are fans pretty much upset? Because, you know, look, Derrick Rose is the poster child for Chicago. I mean, rarely do you get a hometown kid in Chicago that really actually gets a chance to play for the Bulls, right? Historically, I yes. mean, you've had such yes. great players as great Mark players. McGuire, Terry Cummings. I mean, on down the line, Isaiah Thomas that come from the city that didn't have a chance. Saw the talent, which clearly you have with guys like Joe Kim Noah, who's a top five MVP guy a couple of years ago. Pau Gasol, who's won championships as a, as a sidekick, even though he's getting a little bit older. Jimmy Butler is on the precipice of superstardom. And maybe Rose, who you, who you could work with to get back to, you know, 75% of the level he used to be. I think what shocked him, though, is just the, the chemistry on this team and the internal issues that they have in their locker room. I don't think he was anticipating that in making the move. Who could? I mean, right now... I, I can't. I could see it. I could see it from here. 
<laughs> so if I if I could see it, Fred should have seen it. Yeah, and and and, and I kind of agree. I think Fred has to put his foot down. But I, I'm just a little upset that Jimmy Butler had to go public and tell him to put his foot down. Exactly. And, I agree and, with and that. that. That That's the negative yeah. part about it. And, and hopefully Fred can get it together because, as you all both know, he's a very good friend of mine. But he's in an abyss right now. But when do we start to look at the front office of the Chicago? I do. I, I mean, do. When do we start to look at John Paxson and Gar Foreman? I mean, these are the two guys that's making these decisions. They decided to go from a – a hard, I guess, uh, punch you in the gut coach, uh, Tom Thibodeau, uh, to the soft-spoken Fred Hoiberg. When do we start to look at them? I do. I started way before this. This was the way how dysfunctional they were with Thibodeau last three or four years was asinine, and they should be called out on it. Just because you don't get along with them doesn't mean that he has to go. They should. He should still be here, to be honest, if you have, if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I think they were bl- – and I know your your boys with Hoiberg, and it doesn't mean he's not a good head coach, but I think right. they got to look back in retrospect that uh, that they didn't appreciate what Thibodeau was doing there. And Thibodeau probably would have been a lot more successful the last couple of years if he had the support of the front office because you know how it is, Eddie, with, mm-hmm. with players. If they know the coach doesn't have the support of the general manager or the ownership, then they don't really need to, to show him the same amount of respect and play as hard for him maybe uh, as they as they do if they know everybody's on the same page. Well, what's going to happen with these Chicago Bulls? Right now, they're a struggling team. And, you know, Cleveland, you know, seemingly now healthy and a danger to run away with the Eastern Conference and not have any foe. I mean, what do you see happening with this team uh, as we continue through the season? If you're asking me first, I see a up and down, a roller coaster year. They'll have a nice little winning streak here. And then they'll have a three or four losing streak right here. And I think they're going to flame out in the playoffs, and you're going to see a lot of finger pointing. I see Paul Gasol is going to want to leave. He's going to want to go play with his brother in Memphis. Uh, Joaquin Noah is going to want to go somewhere where he could go play with a star he could depend on as a as a slight to Rose. And I see I see this thing really going south really fast. Yeah, and, and Eddie, there's already reports this week of a couple of names that could be moved. One, you're never going to be able to move Derrick Rose. Nobody's going no. to take the contract. But Joe Kim Noah's name has been floated about here, even though he's dealing with the shoulder injury. He's a free agent after the year. Pau Gasol and Taj Gibson, their names have all been bandied about, about getting some help on the wing in return. Uh, so so those are some names that could be moved. And also it'll help when they get Mike Dunleavy uh, Jr. back. Yes, yes. Sure going to do enough to uh, to make them a threat to Cleveland. Right now, they, they can't, uh, you know, th- this team right now, they get to the second round. I think they're lucky. The Philadelphia 76ers are like, you know, only one victory so far right at this taping. Yeah. And, and you look at them and you look at the Chicago Bulls, I don't see much difference right now. I, it's dysfunction <laughs> all through that organization. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> One's one in thirty and lost to the Milwaukee Bucks by like fifteen points the other day. <laughs> the worst team in NBA history, and the other one is just uh, got talent, but they're just dysfunctional. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. I appreciate you. And, and Justin, as I told you, as Herbert said, you have no chance with my daughter. Well, I mean, we'll see about that, Eddie. We'll get the invitation in the mail. And one other thing, you told us to wear red to talk about the Chicago Bulls. You and I are both wearing red, but I actually think Herbert's shirt may represent Chicago and the Bulls a little bit better than ours, as his is poop brown. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. And let's hope the Chicago Bulls get it together sooner or later. I mean, it's not rocket science. There's nothing wrong with getting along. It's a normal human function. Nothing wrong with being unselfish. And there's definitely nothing wrong with respect and authority. And that is your coach, Fred Hoiberg. So let's see if they can finally get it together and not wind up this season being another disappointment in Chicago. Now let's move on to this next segment. And this is the segment I like because I get to relive the past along with you. And I get to converse with these individuals. And that's what's so great about it, because we get a chance to catch up and see what they're doing and then recall some of the great times in their career. My guest this week is a polarizing figure. 
Some might argue that he was magic before magic, and he has some historical stats to back that up. His name is Reggie Theus. And Reggie and I, I'll let you check it out. You might think we have issues, but we have a good time. It's time for the segment that makes us shake our heads. You big dummy. Back in the day, with my main man, Reggie Theus, who probably I gave him a thousand assists in his career. Could have gave him more if he had just gave me the ball a little bit more. Yeah, well, that, that's because you didn't want to put it on the floor. That's one thing I knew about you and Woody. If I could get an assist because you guys didn't want to put it on the floor. You know, that's I was sure. Well, I was with Mike Woodson the other day, and and I told him, I said, at least I could go left. See, he <laughs> couldn't go left at all. I mean, at all. he he was handicapped. I mean, he guy got on his left hand and he was just done. And it, you know, but he had a good right hand, but no left. No, there's no doubt about. It. Hey, where's your glasses, though? Well, we're gonna put them on later. I, I saw your Urkel glasses. <laughs> And I'm gonna <laughs> put got mine the big on. horn rims. Yeah, I, yeah. like horn rims. Well, yeah, you know, I, I don't know why I got them so big. People talk about me, but you know, <laughs> we can put them on at the end of this segment. I have no problem with it at all. Now, Englewood High School, that's yeah. big time. I mean, a lot of solid players have come out of there. What's your memory of uh, playing back in high school? 1975, Eddie knows, on a serious note, you know, we were the first group in California to, to be integrated to Inglewood High School because we were supposed to go to Morningside High School, but they bust us to Inglewood. So I had a really interesting upbringing when it comes to that, you know, because I experienced white flight. Uh, I experienced a, a different culture at, at an early age. Uh, it, it was a lot of battles, a lot of racial situations, a lot of tension, but it was really one of the best things that ever happened to me because it exposed me to another culture, exposed me to different people. It, and it really kind of broadened my perspective on a lot of different things. But it was a it was a learning experience, but a great one, though. Well, you know, Paul Pierce went there, but, you know, who's the, best, right. who's the best player out of Inglewood? You know, I got, I got a great story. You'll love this. My, when I was, playing, when I was uh, with TNT, Paul Pierce was doing a, a game in Boston. And my first interview with Paul Pierce, I walked up to Paul Pierce and said, so, Paul, how does it feel to be the second best player out of Inglewood High School? <laughs> he goes, ah, oh, I'm, I'm just glad he didn't show me his wallet. That's, uh, <laughs> That's it, right? Show me, his, show me his rings. It's funny, though. He had a few he of those. We still laugh about that, by the way. And you took those skills on to UNLV and played for a tremendous coach in, 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 in Jerry Tarkanian. And I know you have a lot of memories about that. You know, it, it, when I think of Tark, I get chills because, you know, it was an era that, you know, we started a lot of the people say they want to play up tempo basketball, they want to play fast break basketball. You know, Eddie, we averaged 110 points a game with no three point line. We were really getting them up. And people don't understand that we scored a lot of points, not because we were so great offensively, which we were, but it was our defense that really got it going. And, and one of the things that really helped me is I was the point on our press. I had to guard the, the little six foot point guards right. and stuff like that. And people don't realize that, see, I got drafted into the NBA as a defensive player. Now, you don't even know that, do you? No, 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 no. <laughs> that, that's sort of like I got drafted into the NBA as a power forward. <laughs> and they changed that quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the last time I played defense, by the way. Well, that's okay. I mean, but your offense took up a lot and you had a lot of responsibility. and. In my estimation, coming into the league as a ninth pick in 1978 for the Chicago Bulls, you were magic before magic. Mm, yeah, you know, magic 6'9", I was 6'7". You know, I, he and I are the only two legitimate 6'7", 6'9", point guards to ever play in the league. And, and it's uh, just an honor to, to really be kind of in that category. But, you know, you know, magic was magic. But you know what my nickname was in high school? My nickname was Houdini. So you're learning some stuff. Yeah, today, yeah, yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, yeah. Who <laughs> Dini? Who Dini? Yeah, yeah, that was what because what on defense you disappear. Oh wow, you got. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Now there is a couple of guys that I played with for sure that I was a better defensive player than you. Well, there's no doubt about my that. offense was always my defense. I will not lie. Okay, <laughs> I second that yeah, one. I'm yeah, good yeah. with that. Yeah, I, I won't lie. Now. You know, I think if you look back on your career, you'll see so many disappointments because you had a great career. Yeah. But I would think one of them would be not getting a chance to play alongside Michael Jordan and prove 
mm. that it can be done. Eddie, I got, I got buzzard luck when it comes to that kind of thing. I got I got traded 15 minutes before the deadline. They couldn't have traded me, and then they drafted Michael Jordan the next the next uh, season. 15 minutes. If I held on 15 more minutes, I would have. There's no telling where my career would have been, and I could have been Paxton. You know, I could have right. easily done. I could have easily handled the ball for Michael. Um, but that would have been something special because he was uh, by far, you know, the toughest opponent to ever deal with. And, you know, but we always appreciate Michael because we had the Jordan rules in those days. Right. You know, if you had fouls to give, you was not going to be nobody's poster. Yeah. Just, just give it to him. Yeah. But you came to a good team. Yeah. You know, you came to us in Kansas City, you know. <laughs> yeah, how about Cotton? Ratchet. Yeah. Ratchet, I got you out of purgatory. I got you out of purgatory. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and only if he knew, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he took you from the he took you from the palace beginning. <laughs> you know what the, the the thing is that that was a great moment for me because Cotton, I'll never forget. Cotton Fitzsimmons came up to me. He says, "Reggie, I and you know remember if you remember, I played that first night I got there. Right. Cotton said, "Reggie, look, I know you don't know the plays, but when you get the ball, just do what you do. <laughs> Put it in all. <laughs> now, you know, you can imagine, you know." It's well documented what I went through in the last month or two in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I had the weight of the world on me. And Cotton said those words to me and really just lifted everything off my shoulders. And 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 to be honest with you, it, it was a great part of my life. Because, you know, I don't want to butter you up at all, but I've met some lifelong friends on that right. team. Right, and that, you know? that's key. And that team that we were on, I mean, it's continued. I mean, you talk yeah. about, you know, Mike Woodson, LaSalle Thompson, and you know, on down the line. I mean, you had to share the ball with Larry Drew, and that had to be right. difficult for you because both of you all, he was a young player as well, right. trying to right. make his way. And, uh, you know, we had guys like Josie Merriweather who passed away a few years ago, yeah. uh, Reggie Kings. We had Reggie a lot King. of quality players on that team. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you, you start to think about you start to think about that team and the relationships and the guys who went on to be successful people. Mm -hmm. You know, that that team, there's a lot of guys, you know, you talk about Larry Drew, yourself, yep. me, Woody. I mean, you think about LaSalle, there's a lot of guys that are still really involved in basketball. They've gone on to be head coaches. A very interesting team. We, we weren't, we, we're, it's going to be hard for us to win some games, but we were going to score with anybody. Yeah, we were. It, it was exciting. Uh, and then we took it on to Sacramento. You know, yeah. I have my own thoughts of Sacramento when we moved there, what, four years later. Yeah. But what's some of your memories? Because I'd never experienced anything like that ever when we went there for the first time. You know, the, the white limos, you know, it was kind of weird, you know going to Sacramento because I'm from LA yeah you yeah you right, got yeah they, they got mad at you yeah I, they got, I got in trouble because I said <laughs> Sacramento is not in California you know but I'm everybody says hey you're going back to LA you're going back to California you're going to and they're thinking about Southern California well Northern California is very different and Sacramento is extremely different than LA basically before the Kings got there right. it was really only the capital you know and and, and there really wasn't anything else there I mean, we have one major hotel, you know, one nightclub, you know, uh, and there wasn't a lot there. So the Kings really did a lot for that uh, for that city in itself. And now the franchise, you know, a new arena downtown is just huge. But I know one thing. I know the, the thing is for sure, the relationships that we built over the years in Sacramento is unbelievable. I mean, I never go back to Sacramento and not feel like it's home for me. Right. And that's, and that's the same thing. You know, it's really the same thing for me in Chicago. Right. And, you know, for me, though, Eddie, it's the same thing even in Vegas. Yeah. You know, I, it, you know, when you really have great relationships and you learn how to build relationships and people and when it's genuine, mm -hmm. you know, people really, you know, they gravitate towards you and they 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 want to they want to love you like that. But that goes to show, though, what a quality basketball player you were. And, and I don't think you get the mention for that, you know, yeah. and. And I know that has to be tough on you. It was what's amazing, and people don't know this, and the fact that you didn't miss many games when you played. No. You know, you didn't miss many games. I mean, I think basically in your, in your what, 14-year career, uh, I'm thinking you only missed maybe 40 games at most. You know, Eddie, career. I played my first six years and never missed a game. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I can tell Kevin Lockery sat me on the bench that I missed a game. 
Mm -hmm. And that was not due to injury. That right. was his choice. And in today's but, game, when you watch today's game and you see guys out for two weeks with an ankle injury, it's, it's yeah, got to drive you crazy. Now. I can't play. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to drive you crazy. He's a sore. I can't play. <laughs> Tape him up and get him out of here. It's different. It's different. But I'm going to give you a note. And I don't even know if you know it. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a note about yourself. And by the way, I'm going to tell you something. This is really cool. Yeah, you know, well, you know. No, 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 this is this is a lot of fun. It's back in the day. Yeah, it's back in the day. And, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, there, we got a lot of stories from back in the day. A lot of stories. A lot of stories. I'm going to hit you with something, though. Yeah. I, you probably know it or you don't. But I want you to answer the question. How many players can you say, all right, finished in the top 50 all-time scoring and top 25 in assists? It's only one player. At the guard position. Top 50. Big guard. At the two guard position, two guard, not point guard. All right. Okay? Because we got to term you as that combo guard. All right? It's only one player in the history of the game that finished in the top 25 in scoring. All right? And yeah. the top, no, top 50 in scoring and top 25 in assists. Well, I, who is that? You, young man. <laughs> no. Wow, that's at, pretty, at, at, at one that's point you've been time, doing your homework. At one point, this is the Eddie I know. You're doing your homework. I do my homework. At, at one point in time, it was you and Jerry West, yeah. but he fell out. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing? And when you, you look know, at the Hall of, sometimes you never realize, you know, what you accomplished. I know that when I retired, I was 22, 22nd in the history uh, in scoring and 10 or 11 in assists when yeah. I retired. Yeah. 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 It, it's amazing. A lot of people don't know that. No. You know, we were unfortunate because, and you did in, toward the end of your career, Eddie, but I never got a chance to play on, you know, a lot of teams that were, you know, n playoff teams and, and playing on national TV. So a lot of a lot of the things about me, people people missed. Exactly. Yeah, it but you got, up. toward the end of your career, you even got, like, you got the nice run in, in Houston, which, yeah. uh, you know, you're still living off that salary. You're still getting the paycheck, right? Well, it helped. Yeah, it helped. I, I don't. I was limping up and down. I mean, as a 39 year old man, I was tricking them. Yeah, I, I was tricking them. Trust me. Hey, you know what's funny? No, nope, you know, young cats don't care about when you limp. Yeah. Because because when I came in the league, my my rookie year in the league, I caught Walt Frazier and Pistol Pete Maravich in their last year of their careers, and both of them were on one leg, and wow. I did not care. No, you want to bust them up. <laughs> Buzz them up. It's all over with. I got the story, and that's all that matters. Yeah. Now, the you know. The respect I have for those guys. As your career went on, you were segwaying. You know, a tremendous career. You know, I'm sure you'd have liked to have won a championship. You'd like yeah, to have no. played in more playoff games. You know, unfortunately, it just didn't roll that way. Right. But when you look at it, you look at the total package of what you've done, and then you look at the Hall of Fame, and you're seeing how guys are getting in there. You know, in my mind, your name comes up, a Tom Chambers comes up, a Kevin Johnson comes up, and yeah. they have all these reasons why they're putting guys in, but I'm sure it has to, you know, get your attention somewhat on how they're doing this and the parameters that they're looking at. It's a little frustrating, you know, when you know that there's only there's only seven players that ever scored 19,000 points and have over 6,000 assists. Mm -hmm. There's only one player in that group that has one that has more points and assists than you, mm -hmm. and it's Oscar Robertson. Right. So right. when you're in a company like that, um, the problem is, is is that they try to make the criteria be about championships. Right. And that's really not true in every situation. Right. And it really shouldn't be about championships. It's about it's a it's an individual uh, accomplishment. Right. But you know when you score that many points, and and not only that, you have to look at the you know the position that I play. There's only been one other person in the history of the game that have that plays that position like I played, and right. that's Magic Johnson. Not that I even will put myself in his category, but there's only been two of us that have been our size and played that position like that. Yeah, don't you think it's always the luck of the draw? I mean, it's always like, like I said, you were 15 minutes away from having to stay in Chicago and right. prove that you can play next to Michael Jordan. Right. And just like that, you know, you're in Kansas City and you know, we struggled big time. Right. I mean, we made the playoffs the year before we went to Sacramento and then the first year in Sac, right. we were always three and out. We were just right. young, we didn't have enough. 
So it always, when you look at your career, you can just look at little snippets and say, man, if I just had done that a little bit longer, or if I'd have been lucky here. You know what though, you know, we're so blessed. And you know, I know that's, I don't want to get sappy on you or anything <laughs> like that, but yeah, it, there's a lot of things that could have happened, but there's a lot of things that negative that could have happened also. Exactly. So, you know, I, I'm a firm believer, Eddie, that you and I are where God wants us to be right now. Mm -hmm. You're exactly where he wants you to be. I'm where I want he wants me to be. And when it's supposed to happen, it happens because he wants it to. And I really don't want it if it's not supposed to be. Yeah. It, it, so you just have to kind of roll with it and not. And one of the things, and you can, you can attest to this because I'm sure you've had your moments too. One of the positive things about being an old veteran that uh, uh, has been or mm -hmm. used to used to be in the NBA, all that kind of stuff. If you can come out of the NBA and you are not an old, jaded, angry player, right? you've done a lot. You've done a lot. You've done a lot. You've done, and so you've you, handled that. But you, life. you handled that well. I mean, even segueing, even doing your career, you networked as well as anyone. You knew what you wanted to attack. And you were a trendsetter. I hate to say it, but you know, I remember back in Sacramento, <laughs> I'm telling you, man, our wives used to be like, oh, Reggie, he dressed so nice. Oh, Reg <laughs> he used to make me sick. And then yeah, you woman in with the leather that's on. That's my girl. She's, that's yeah. my girl. Don't, yeah, don't you come in with the leather on. All of a sudden, I'm wearing leather, you know. And no, you no, was no, a no. trendsetter, though. No, I no, mean, Don't blame the, that on me. No, but no, no but the no. way you dress, yeah. I mean, around the league, you were a trendsetter in, in, in how you dress. But all that carried over to obviously what you wanted to do and – one, obviously, be it, be an actor, which yeah. you did that very well, and and then transition well, into that, coaching. Thanks. <laughs> no, you did. I mean, look, you on you was on you on a series every week. Yeah, here I was Coach Fuller on Hang Time. This is the last Coach Fuller you'll ever see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so no remakes? <laughs> no, no, that's the last one. You know, I, you know, Eddie, we like to dress though. I mean, that was our era. You know, to put on a suit and a tie mm -hmm. and. We were very respectful when it came to how we dealt with our attire and how we presented ourselves. That's how we were brought up. Right. To respect the game, to res respect the people around. And, you know, things changed. The hip hop, you know, world took over. And the guys are just reflecting the, the times now. Um, not my cup of tea, but, you know, they do their thing. It's yeah. okay. But you went, in, you went into coaching. And, uh, you know, your first your first stop was New Mexico State. Had a tremendous yeah. run there. Yeah. And, and then obviously got the call you wanted. You know? Well, you know, it's it's a funny thing. You know, sometimes you gotta you know be you know, sometimes you gotta think about what you wish for, right? Right. Um, you know, coming out of the University of Louisville with Coach Patino, you know, I learned a lot about coaching teams and running a program. I took basically the Louisville, you know, program and implemented it into New Mexico State. We went. I took over a team that won six games, and in two years, we went from 16 wins to 25 wins, mm -hmm. and made it to the NC two A's. Um, you know, I got a call, and when I got the call that, about the NBA, it's who gets a chance to become an NBA head coach from a mid-major college? Right. You know, so you have to go. Yeah. And the money jump was enormous, so right. it was really a no-brainer. But you know, in retrospect, you think about, you know how they, you know, the, the league treats their coaches. I was a dead man walking when I took the job. Yeah. I had no chance of keeping that job. Yeah. Because, you know, and we won 38 games that year. And Eddie, if they would have given me any support, we could have been 500 very easily. Right. And it's very sad because even to today, no coach has won 38 games since I left. So the, the, it's it was a really tough situation. If I had to do it all over again, I would go because of what it represents. Right. I know that it made me a better coach. Mm -hmm. I got a chance to coach the best players in the in the world. Mm -hmm. I got to coach against the best coaches in the world. I got to see and understand what NBA basketball was like from a coaching perspective. Right. It's made me a better coach on every level. It's given me the ultimate credibility in terms of recruiting. And realistically, it gave me the ultimate credibility, and even in the broadcasting world, because when it's all said and done, one day when I go back to broadcasting, I've really done everything there is in basketball. Right. I, it was, I was a high-level player. Um, 
you know, I, I, I coached the game, I played the game and, uh, you know, everything else. So it really gave me the ultimate credibility to be on that level. But if I had to do it all over again, I would do the same thing, but I would have thought about it a lot harder. But because, now you have your latest challenge, right? Yeah. How's that going? It's, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge. But you know what? I haven't Cal had Cal State since. Northridge, correct? Cal State Northridge, CSUN. We just we, we renamed it, uh, rebranded everything. We got the, Now we play in the place called the Black Top. You have to look it up. It's, it's a nice gym. Okay. It really looks good on television, and we call it the Black Top. Uh, there's a lot of positive things that have happened here. The, my AD, Dr. Brandon Martin, has done tremendous things in terms of branding the program um, and making us at least you know viable. I missed going to the NC2As my first year by one point. Mm -hmm. I took a team that hadn't been to the NC2As in three years. No, it hadn't been to the conference tournament in three years, Eddie. Mm -hmm. And after my first year, we took them to the championship in the conference tournament and lost by one point. Wow. But it, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's unfortunate that the, the last, my first year we had APR problems. You know, last year they sat some players down and then this year, there's you know who knows what's going to happen. So, next year will be the first year that I'm going to get uh, my entire team on the floor. And it's, it's going to be my fourth year, so it's a challenge, but it's a, it, I think has a really a great opportunity to be a great, great program. You know, Gonzaga started off like we did. San Diego State mm -hmm. started off like 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 we are right now. Uh, I know that in five years from now we're going to get a new building. So it has great potential. So I'm 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 happy. I'm 40 minutes from my house. Didn't have to buy a new home. Right. And yeah. You, so you it's, go it's, play. It's, you could go play golf in the middle of it and, and take my money. Yeah. You know, yeah, you, yeah. Are, you are. And now a my shark. son's transferred from South Carolina. He's here. So it's it's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Reggie's there. And by the right? way, I do take your money in golf. So let's let's make sure we know that. No, you you you're much better than what you put off. And you convinced <laughs> me the last time we played. I'm gonna give you your due. I'm gonna give you your due. Hey, hey, Woody found out too, by the way. Yeah, well, please, well, let's not talk about his golf game. <laughs> Mike Woodson's golf game is just a joke. Oh, it's funny. It's How about joke. Otis Thorpe, though? Otis, Otis is fine. He can play. Yeah. Yeah, Otis can play. I, I was his excited. Hands are this big, Eddie, but I he's know. got soft hands around the greens, too. I know. I know. All right. Five quick questions. This is our rapid fire segment. You don't have to take long to answer it. All right. All right. What animal do you compare yourself to? A gazelle. Why? It's quick, agile, jumps. The only thing I don't like about the gazelle is, is that he's low on the food chain. <laughs> <laughs> you got to fiend for yourself. Yeah, you got you to gotta run. Who was your favorite athlete growing up and why? That's a tough one. That's a tough one, Eddie, because I really wasn't a big sports, you know, guy growing up. I loved to play sports, you know, but as a basketball player, I loved Dr. Dr. J growing up. You know, when you look at that, Jerry West, you know, when I, I saw him make the half court shot, um, got a chance to make a shot on him at, at, at Camp Clutch when I was in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. So I was a huge Jerry West fan. Who was the guy in the league or in college, whatever, that when you played against him, you just wanted to bust him up. Wow. Everybody. Everybody. There was somebody you didn't like. You know what? I wanted to bust everybody. It, it, I'm, you know, I took it personal every time I stepped out on the court. It wasn't anybody that I had any, any, anything against. But it was, I wanted to get mine on everybody. You know, uh, you, come on. You, who was yours? Man, it was, man, any, like Reggie Miller. <laughs> okay. Because of the way Reggie used to stare at me sometimes. <laughs> and I didn't know Reggie then. Yeah. You know, after I got to know him and played with him, I loved him to death. Yeah. But beforehand, I just wanted to bust him up. You know, I used, I went at Danny Ainge a lot, you know. Bill Lambeer, I couldn't wait to get, get, get him. Oh, they not, see there, yeah, see? Yeah, but, that, you know, those are guys I took it a little bit more personal. You know, because I know him, Bill. We played, I played against Bill in high school. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, we, I worked with him in Minnesota. Bill's a great guy, but, you know, Bill's Bill, if you know what I mean. All right, well, okay, so, and I know it's somebody, so don't tell me it's not, okay? Ooh. If you could smack, if you could have smacked somebody and got away with it, who would it be? 
It doesn't Kevin have to Lockery. be a player. Kevin Lockery? <laughs> Kevin Lockery. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been the first player to choke a coach. That's what happened. <laughs> Why? 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 Why would you want to smack him? <laughs> yeah, because of what he did to me. <laughs> and never told me why. He benched me, didn't want me around. For what? I don't know. But no, it was it was brutal. Yeah, no, I, I basically I probably should have. What's your most prized possession? My most prized possession, basketball wise? Anything. Family, kids. You know, doesn't it, you know? All of it's for nothing if you don't have somebody to play for. I I tell all our guys all the time, it's not about you. Mm. You know, you when you learn to live your life for somebody else, and you learn to live your life and share your life, you when you become a father, you learn those things, and and you go, you know, it's about family, and and we fight day in and day out because of our family. If it was just us, I could go live in the woods someplace, Eddie, and live in a in a in a in a shack. You know, and hunting fish for the rest of my life. But, you know, my wife wouldn't have that. Well, Houdini. Yeah. Thanks for joining Put us. Your back on well, you, oh, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Look at that. Now, whose glasses are the worst? Huh? Oh, yours are horrible. <laughs> the, look, no, yeah, see, <laughs> you don't even look like yourself. If I was you, I wouldn't wear them glasses anywhere. No. I'm hey, telling you. And yeah. look, it, makes, it makes me look coachy. It makes me look coachy. That, that's it. That's yeah. it. it. Makes me look like well, going Well, from one blind old guy to the next. Thanks for joining <laughs> us on Back of the Day. What's that? Thanks for joining us on Back of the Day, baby. Back in the day. All we right. got a lot of Back in the Day. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Rick. Welcome back. What a great interview that was. And that's why I enjoy that segment. It gives us that opportunity to really get to know athletes from the past and then catch up with them. Reggie Theus was definitely an underappreciated basketball player. And I'm glad he got the opportunity to share some stories with you. And especially who he would slap. That's so funny. Well, let's move on. I have thoughts about a lot of things when it comes to sports. Here's my next one. Here are Eddie's final thoughts. The Golden State Warriors did something no one thought they would do last year. They won a championship. They came from nowhere. But yet, after winning the championship, a lot of people wanted to put an asterisk next to it because they deemed their run to the title as being lucky. And they pointed to the fact that they didn't have to play the Los Angeles Clippers to get there. They didn't have to play the San Antonio Spurs. And when they played a Memphis team, they were beat up and injured. And the Rockets in the conference finals were struggling with Dwight Howard not being 100%. And then lo and behold, when they get to the finals, everybody said, well, they beat a Cleveland team that stretched them early in the series without Kevin Love and Kyrie Irving, who got injured in game one. Well, Bob Myers, their general manager, told me, Eddie, it's not that we were lucky. He said we weren't unlucky. What a great quote that was. And now entering in the 2015-16 season, the Golden State Warriors obviously with a lot to prove. And boy, have they proven it. They became the first team in the history of professional sports in all four leagues to start a season by winning their first 15 games. And we're moving at trying to accomplish something that no one has since the 1971-72 Lakers. And that's won 33 straight games. Now, they came up short. The Milwaukee Bucks beat them in game 25. But I'm here to tell you that I think that streak of 24 straight to start a season was much more impressive than the 33 that the 71-72 Lakers did. And here's why. For all the things that I mentioned before I started to speak about everyone thinking that they were unlucky, they stayed focused. And despite not having their head coach Steve Kerr coach them because he's out with back surgery, and having small minor injuries during the course of this streak, 
The Golden State Warriors won 24 straight games in a row. That is amazing to me because me as an ex-athlete and going through training camp, the one thing coaches used to indirectly always tell us, guys, we're going to treat the first two weeks of the season almost as an extension of training camp. And boy, did the Warriors start the season playing as if it was mid-season. That 24 games in a row were as impressive as anything I have ever seen in sports. And all the credit goes to the maturity and the professionalism of 15 young men on the Golden State Warriors who not only love the game of basketball, but they respect one another. Leadership is one of the major reasons right now that a lot of teams are struggling. And not just leadership on the team in general. I'm talking about leadership from ownership all the way down to the custodian at the arena. If you ever want to take a look at why someone struggles, a lot of times it's not at the heart of the matter, it's at the things that's all around it. And the Golden State Warriors right now, they have it together. They are a piece of work. And if you're looking for success in how to build a blueprint to build an organization and a team that has success and continue it despite the accolades that they have received so far, the hunger that they still employ every night, then I suggest you take a look at the Golden State Warriors. They are pure class right now and professionalism at its finest. Well, we are at the end of another podcast. Thank you for joining me for What's On My Mind with Eddie Johnson, podcast number three. I appreciate you. Please continue to visit my website at eddiejohnson8.com and my Facebook fan page, What's On My Mind with Eddie Johnson. I appreciate you visiting me, leaving your reviews, and also downloading me at iTunes as you're driving, checking out the audio version of my podcast. I thank you so much. And I'd like to take the opportunity again to thank my guest this week. I appreciate the fact that Reggie Theus gave me a few minutes from coaching to sit down with me. Also, Herbert Bias Jr., my brother-in-law, who's a radio star in the making. Thank you, as well as my co-host on Sirius XM NBA Radio, the NBA Today Show, one of the best radio hosts in the business, Justin Termini. Thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate you. Again, thank you, my listeners, for downloading me and sending me your wonderful messages and reviews from week to week. Again, this is all brought to you by my sponsor, Jason Mitchell Realty Group. Please visit him at mitchellgroupaz.com or call at 480-522-1030. He is simply the best in the business. If you want your home sold or you're looking to purchase, give him and his team a call. Another great week. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you in future podcast number four. Until then, take care.